Tom here from Lawrence Systems and welcome to a special sponsored interview and technical demo. Sponsors are chosen for my channel based on what I feel is in alignment with you, the audience, and we'll be discussing either a product or having a conversation that I hope you will find interesting, engaging, or useful, maybe even all three. Now let's get to the sponsor for this video, which is Sasslio. We are going to be covering how they can uncover, manage, and secure your client's SaaS ecosystem. This is a really cool product. We're working on using a demo right now at my office and testing it with our clients. This is a really interesting product when it comes to giving you really solid visibility into what's going on in the browser, where people are logging in, what they're logging into, and what you know email addresses they're using to do this. This is a real blind spot that well, with everything going to the cloud, we need more visibility into, and Sassio has a product for that. So me and John have a fun conversation about it, and so let's get started. Hey, John, how you doing today? Hey, I'm doing good today. How are you, Tom? I'm doing great, and we're ready to dive into some data on this. And this has been fun because I've been testing the product as well, so it's yeah. not just a sponsored spot. I've I've actually found this really interesting, and we're looking at how we integrate it to our stack because we have all these tools to get compliant, to manage the inventory of software. But then what do we hear every day? We're in the cloud. Everything's in the cloud. And we have some clients that just, well, many people are going to resonate with this. There's no on-prem servers anymore. It's all yeah. in the cloud. We still have to make an inventory of the things they use. It may not be the traditional software, but that's where you're like filling that gap in a very interesting way is just being able to collect all that. Where'd this uh, idea come from? Well, I, first off, Tom, isn't it great that we don't have to worry about little server closets anymore with the new businesses? I've been in enough of those and finagle around them. Um, yeah. Now, they're not all gone. We wish we could get there, but we're getting uh, close. I, I'm back and forth. I like some things on prem still uh, when it's yeah. reasonable. There's use cases for it, but you're right. There's definitely lots of unmaintained servers that are the only thing they're doing is providing botnets um, a place to yeah. live. <laughs> That's exactly. That's a whole other a whole another topic. But as far as an application standpoint, um, this is almost like a blind spot. Is this you know where are where are people going? Where are my people going? Because the first place I'm testing this, of course, is internally at my office. Because I want to know <laughs> where are my people going? What are they yeah. signing into? Who has what? And uh, you obviously seen this. Uh, you worked in the MSP space, so you see this as a problem yourself, and probably what led up to this. Yeah, exactly. And that was actually kind of perfect, right? The only reason uh, I've climbed in enough little small data center rooms is because I've been in the MSB world. I spent 13 years in it prior to starting this business. Um, but you're right. You're hitting on a key pain. Um, most small businesses today are really just born in the cloud. Um, the ones that have a lot of prem are migrating most of it or predominant to the cloud, except for, of course, always great use cases. Um, but back when I was still working at the MSP back in 2015, there were only eight SaaS apps for the, the normal company. And now we're seeing it up to like 135 SaaS apps. And I just remember back in the day, it was always guesswork. Uh, we were always trying to figure out what the customer was using. It was manual, it was uh, tedious, it was error prone. And so it kind of bothered me, right? Because we talk about uh, software inventory, you know. The RMMs do a great job of telling you what's on the computer. Um, they'll let you know everything installed in the world. But the minute that user clicks Google Chrome or Microsoft Firefox, it's just a visibility gap. And so uh, what it boils down to is MSPs have great visibility on the endpoint. They have fantastic network tools and collectors out there to know what's going on the network. Yet that number two line item on the uh, customer's budget, which is probably SaaS only under them, uh, it's a complete blind spot. So that's really all we started with was to solve visibility in the blind spot. And the product has changed and morphed along the way. But that was our original marching mission. And I think part of it, too, that people don't realize is the onboarding, offboarding process. And until an employee is gone, something happens, they leave the company. No one always knows what that particular person was doing over time, not just on a daily basis, but sometimes on a monthly cycle. There's so many different websites they have to log into, whether it's regulatory ones where they have to update information, upload information, and keep those up to date. So having that list is not easy to get to go. This job role has these defined websites that they have to go to to upload this data. The other thing in data loss prevention is constantly... Everyone's trying to load an app to stop data loss prevention, but we already know where it's going. They're uploading it to the cloud. <laughs> That's, if they're if they're getting rid of the data, and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this happened at Google, and even Google had got kind of blindsided by this because 
someone uploaded things just using a different Google account. So of course they're using Google accounts, but which Google account? And this is where, unless you're in the browser, you don't have visibility in there. So that you, it's another spot. It's not just the inventory of things that people are going to. It's also what login do they use for Office 365 Dropbox? Maybe you have a business Dropbox, but I just log into my personal Dropbox. So I'm not going to trip any alarms in terms of SIM monitoring or any of the other normal stack of tools. Your normal web monitoring goes, well, yeah, they went to Dropbox, but what account did they log in with? So you, you get that extra insight with that. Yeah, that extra insight is something we've definitely matured into just out of necessity. I mean, Google had their incident. What was Tesla who had their incident with uh, code being pulled out yep. with developers and Dropbox. Um, and even if you follow some of the latest security events, uh, you, know, you know, where people are getting compromised during these apps and using personal accounts back to the Cisco breach. I know we did a big push yeah. a couple of weeks ago for our product around that Cisco breach response. But, um, you know, just it's a lack of visibility that has lots of problems that as soon as you start to pull open the hood, you start to realize, boy, uh, what have we gotten ourselves into? And it, it's kind of fun because, you know, our partners are the ones that are telling us what they want to see and what they want to build. But going back to that offboard journey, um, I don't know. I, I, I feel like everybody here has probably dealt with that pain. Hey, what did what did Susie, the VP of sales, use? Right. Are you running a... Uh, run a report from the RMM. She must have used Python SDK, uh, Java, the, the Java <laughs> runtime. That's what Susie was running. Um, right. And it's it's interesting because this, this came up again with one of our clients. Uh, they have someone who's higher up at the company. And well, you know, because we haven't fully embedded this, that question is there. They do not know all the websites this person has access to because they knew they weren't using a password manager for a lot of it. And they know the person wasn't good. They were higher up C-level person. And yeah. uh, their fear is they can still log into sites, but they're not sure what all sites they are logged into. So this is yeah, case in point. .net. They were using .NET. Pot. <laughs> Just trust yeah. me, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's... Demo the product, Lila. So yeah, what, some of the insights that you get from this. This is this is where this is going to be fun. Yeah, absolutely. I, this is my favorite part. So, uh, you know, being a technologist, this is uh, this is something I can do every day. But um, we talk about some of these other things, right? You know, we, we hit on the Cisco thing. We talked about having a password manager, LastPass. And I know I, we were just chatting before uh, off screen a little bit about that LastPass breach and your response to it. I love the response, the way that you did it with uh, your wife. That was hilarious. It sounds like yeah. that video is doing really well. Yeah, it's so, one of those things where it's it's how the common users see it and uh, yeah. us as people providing technology, we want to make things as easy as possible to read and to understand so they're actionable. And it's that impact with the general users. And this is something I like about when you first log into Saslo, you see the recent breaches and suggested actions. So you don't have to disseminate everything. Maybe you didn't even know Plex had a breach recently, but you know, suggested action, change passwords. Uh, LastPass does not recommend action on behalf, which makes sense to me um, after reading it. Some users panic, but yeah. it's... But that's the point. I, I think not only do people not know what people are uh, using, but... Because this is so new, uh, especially for the industry that we serve, the managed service provider industry, um, they don't know how to react. And so our team is not only curating all this data to help tell you what the customers are using and how to handle operational things like SaaS ops around onboarding and offboarding. We're also monitoring for SaaS security events, opening up tickets in your PSA when those events happen and telling you or telling your techs what need to happen in that case. So... In this event here, you can see, you know, we didn't have any customers in our environment with LastPass, but maybe we had five clients impacted by the Slack breach. And we can give you the list of users, give you the list of clients, and all that would pop up into your uh, actual PSA. And so SaaS third-party security breach monitoring is one of those things that we really like um, giving because it's a really invisible area. Not only do you not know they're using Slack, but you don't know when the breach happens and you don't know how to respond. And so we bring that together. That's just one of the areas we focus in on there. Right. And it's this is something if you don't know the inventory of web applications your client's using, when there's an incident on those, you're like, what? I, I don't know. Do, do Cool. This is breach. But how many clients do I have using it? That's not an easy one to answer. I mean, I can pull yeah. my software inventory that I have through my RMM and say, oh, yeah, I know everyone using this in this version of this program. So we have to make sure this is all patched and updated for them. But the completely different animal once it goes into the web. <laughs> Yeah. And in a lot of the cases, you really can't. Uh, there's not much for you to do, but there's sometimes recommendations. But I put it this way, uh, like the video with um, your wife earlier, when she got the response from um, LastPass, it's like, 
well, wouldn't it be nice if the MSP could at least communicate to their customers without having to wait for the vendors to tell them? Wouldn't it be nice if that person they're paying the money to came to them and said, hey, not only do we see this tool, uh, maybe a shadow IT or something that shouldn't be there, but this is an incident that's happened. Maybe that you know, promotes them into dealing with the situation of using Slack when it's shadow IT or something. Yeah. Like that. Now let's touch on something that I probably should have started with was how you get this <laughs> deployed, how you get this set up. This is, yeah. this is an agent that runs on endpoints and a yeah. browser plugin option that you have as well. Yeah, so the beauty of our platform um, is deployment is simple. We, it was built by text for text, really. Um, I think, Tom, you can attest to that when yeah. you trialed internally. Um, but, you know, first off, we just integrate into the PSAs or the RMMs you've got. Um, it's not that hard to set up the configuration. We make sure that each step-by-step integration guide is less than 10 steps. Um, and when you deploy SESLEO, you just deploy it once into your RM or you configure it once in your RMM. And then you can press the button onto an endpoint. And when it deploys on the endpoint, it configures the client and the SASLEO dashboard. It inherits all the partner application stack rules. It inherits all the other workflow rules, like alerting on data breaches, alerting on high-risk shadow IT. And then it builds it and then curates the rest of the data moving forward for you for things like your QBR lifecycle, which we recommend, or uh, putting data into lifecycle integrations or some of our other integrations. And so... Um, the platform itself deployment pushes a endpoint agent out. And then what it does is the configuration of the client screen here. And then that endpoint push actually will also configure the browser extension. Um, those two things are actually talking in tandem. So the endpoint agent, the browser extension, maybe people don't know under the hood, they're actually full-time communicating to understand which users logged in on the device. What user are they logging in into in the browser? Do we see any security events there? Um, it's capturing data upload, data download, none of the sensitive contents, but the type of data, the name right. of the file, like we probably shouldn't see password.xlsx upload in the Dropbox, but we do. Um, yeah. And <laughs> yeah, we do. We should never uh, even see password.xls, all right? <laughs> yeah, you should never see it, period. That, that can yeah. be its own tool, like password, Leo, if that exists anywhere in your computer, password yeah. should not exist. Um, but yeah, that's where we catch that rich user metadata up in the browser extension of, and behaviors inside the browser. And this is something I want to point out. You're not doing this by doing a man in the middle certificate, correct? You're doing this all by the browser plugin. Yeah, and that's the beauty. The, the deployment, you don't have to go configure the network. You don't have to go set up rules inside your firewall equipment. You literally just push a button on your endpoint and start getting rich data. And, and that's important because this way it does not interfere with a other tools a lot of people have that do because it's necessary the man in the middle if you're using some type of web filtering tool um it's going to want to install a certificate many enterprise firewalls or enterprise proxies have a certificate in there and you don't want to have more and more certificates where they're fighting or competing with each other and sometimes you have to put in certificate bypasses because it brings spanking websites because of certificate pinning um uh, the one thing about doing it in the browser, you're at the point before the encryption or after, depending on how you want to look at it, but you're on the unencrypted side. That's how you're able to see which one of the things is going into. You're able to get into like, hey, I can see you logged in with this username in Dropbox or this username in Office 365. Yep, and exactly. That's how we're able to catch some of that data. Yeah. And to be fair, that puts the onus on us and we're really com uh, you know, confident in what we capture and being very cognizant of what we capture too, because we are yeah. at that layer capturing um, data, you know, that doesn't put any level of risk to the organization. They're just usernames, um, you know, stripping query parameters out of any data that might get there. I mean, as engineers, we've thought about these data points that are out there that we could be catching. And so we're really cognizant there and make sure we're only presenting tactical data to the MSP that needs to be there as a result. Yeah. Because you don't capture the password field, but you do capture course, the username yeah. field. Yeah, the, the obvious Goodness. stuff. <laughs> yeah. Goodness, I don't want that data. Um, but No, yeah. you don't want that liability. <laughs> no, not at all. But we, we make sure we do it. And we also are all uh, really cognizant in how we collect it. Because the reason we want that information is to help guide um, recommendations internally. You know, people using personal accounts or people using service accounts or shared accounts to access resources. Um, but even further in the browser extension, we're now capturing like OAuth flows. So we can actually see when a user is logging in with Google or Microsoft that OAuth consent. And we can see some of those security events now. Um, and the reason we find that important is because we actually are now correlating that to the uh, third part of our collecting mechanism, which is the uh, integration into either Workspace or Microsoft 365. 
And so we can correlate a single sign-on OAuth flow in the browser uh, against a single sign-on OAuth flow from 365 to make sure there's a matching indicator. Capturing weird events, we can start flagging things that aren't being driven by the user. Yeah, and that's it's really interesting too. So you think of application security logs as something you would dump from having an endpoint on there watching the app usage, but watching the browser usage and pulling up, it, it is the same thing. It is applications used, even though they're web apps, but you do get a lot of rich data from this and allows you to do different triggering on it. I mean, it's very actionable intelligence. This has been fun as I've been playing with it myself. Yeah, it, and I think what's honestly the most fun, Tom, is we get a lot of uh, partners who will take our data spin it out, you know, configure a webhook out to their data ingestion engines. The things they do are far more fun than the things we can ever think of. We're just trying to build the stuff that people are already hacking together in their MSPs. I mean, this this data has lots of merits and value. It's just useful seeing. It's really fun actually watching the partners push us in different areas on how they're taking it. So what are, what are some of the things you already have built in for actioning on uh, security alerts, essentially? What, what is the anomaly that you would see or something commonly you see in their uh, insight that would trigger to help you know that something's going wrong? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, that's where uh, we have a lot of pretty big things. And it really comes down to configuration. You know, one area that I think SAS Leo does excel in uh, is it's beyond the tech. It's really coming from, you know, our whole founding team were in the MSP business before. So everybody that has the lens, whether it's implementation engineering or sales has the lens of MSP. So what we can do is we can alert on too much uh, or we can alert on too little. And um, we've figured out a nice little magic middle ground, but we can alert on any time a user is using a service account, anytime somebody installs or accesses a new application or puts their data into a new application. Um, we can query those down to, do we only want critical apps? Like, all right, anybody signing up for new file sharing tools, we should know about that. Anybody signing up for, um, you know, a new marketing platform, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, but when that marketing platform, let's say MailChimp was signed up for and we don't alert on it, when it gets breached, like it did earlier in the year, we want to know about that event. And so it's about fine tuning it, but uh, shared accounts, service accounts, data breaches, uh, mismatch single sign on, uh, new apps, all sorts of things we can do uh, alerting on, but a lot richer when we get into the reporting side of things. Yeah, I, I think this is cool, too, because I can't answer the question yet. Um, I don't know exactly how many of my clients might be using MailChimp. I mean, <laughs> you know, because we do a lot of co-managed IT, so maybe their internal IT department knows about it. Maybe they don't. And this is yeah. one of those things. And when there's a breach, you need to tell people actionably because they probably, and this is back to the end user experience, uh, something got breached. I don't, it, maybe that looks like a phishing email because I've been trained on those. I'm just going to delete that thing that says it's probably just trying to get me to click on something or reset my password. And then I'll be talking to the IT department about this phishing email I clicked. I'll just ignore yeah. it. And this way, we're the ones calling the users, doing an interactiveness with them going, no, MailChimp really did have a reason you should reset things or, you know, possibly you lost data or something may have happened. Like, here's the action. Here's us having that conversation with you. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, you don't need to know that MailChimp happened as like a frontline ticket. But when you're building conversations with your customers, you may want to know it's there so that you can talk to them strategically. I, I always make one joke, Tom, uh, and I have to make it on this webinar. It's not really even a good joke. I think it's funny. But like, I always say that like nobody ever wakes up deciding today's the day for a new SaaS tool. Like right. today's the day I'm finally <laughs> using Dropbox. Like I've, I've held off long enough. <laughs> uh, but the reason it happens is because they're just trying to solve a business problem. And right. so if you ever want to hear me get really passionate about SaaS and the management thereof, um, you'll hear me start talking about like talking about SaaS and the, and the vision of business problem solving. You know, imagine as an MSP, you're going from, I didn't know they had MailChimp to, I know they have MailChimp. What business problem are they trying to solve? Oh, I didn't know they were trying to solve this. Maybe I can help inject myself here and support them better here, or they already have a tool that does this, or we have a better tool that can solve this, or think of the strategy that you can really have when every app that you're bringing visibility into is solving a business problem. So well, that's where I get excited. I think that's really an interesting perspective because if you are not just servicing your technology, but also trying to make them more efficient by knowing what apps they use, you can even have some insight. Like, you know, it'd be better if you use this or these apps may work better for you. So that comes back to like strategic business planning, more than just quarterly business review, but like truly acting as like a VCIO. We're like, all right, I'm going to help you guys with your information and help you do something more efficient. 
But first, I need a baseline of what are you using now? What are those tools? Can, that's a hard question just to ask at a table. Yeah. You, it, it may be um, known. It may be lesser known. But this gives you like empirical data. This is here's everything. Here's everything you guys are using now. Um, by the way, you're paying for subscriptions and things like that you may not know about, <laughs> you know, because well, someone logs in once a month in, in this other department and you guys already have a you have a company one over here they're logging into. And this person uses their personal Gmail to log in over here for some reason. <laughs> well, and Tom, you, you hit it on the nose. Actually, it was one of our first go to market partners is they used our tool for AutoCAD license remediation. <laughs> um, but what you hit on the nose was. Um, the fact that this belongs in the QBR. So one thing that's important to realize is there's a lot of alerting that's going to be part of your functional knock area where, you know, high risk events, things that you need to look at, things you need to talk to your customer about. But where the real meat and the value that we see our partners extracting out of Cessna is that QBR cycle. Because here's the deal. Um, you know, people are at first overwhelmed, you know, the 50 person company that has 147 apps, where do I begin? Um, and if there's any takeaway from us, whether you're using Saslio or whether you're using some DNS logs and building your own tool internally, or whether you've got another solution that can find these SaaS, the key things to talk about is, uh, and the way that we found our partners being successful is talking about the top 10 shadow IT, right? You know, in this portal right here, we've got about 190 apps. Um, but imagine going to your quarterly business review where you're normally talking about timeline objectives and where you're going to take their IT but also you know, taking 10 minutes of that QBR and saying, hey, since we last talked, these 10 new shadow IT resources popped up in your organization. Um, you know, These are the people that are using them. Here's the risks we think about it. Like, should this be sanctioned? Should this not? Is there a project here to get this properly rolled or not? Should we take this innovation this one employee has had and elevate it across the organization? Um, there's opportunity in the shadow IT to talk, but it's strategic. We really here at Sasleo don't have this vision that shadow IT is a slap on the wrist approach. It's a, you know, elevating that innovation out there. And we enrich you, I mean, with the data you need to talk to your customer, you know, if you see intercom in an organization, it's not just an icon, it's, it's rich data around the users, how they're spending time in it, how they're accessing it. If there's security events across it, things like that. And I think, you know, back to the cybersecurity side of this right now, business email compromise is huge. It's not talked about because it's not as much fun to talk about as ransomware. But a lot of this comes from not necessarily in Cisco's case in point on this, not necessarily someone figuring out because you've got the best protection. You've got all the filtering in the world on your business email. And then they logged in yeah. with the Yahoo <laughs> address and you didn't yeah. realize it. There was a social engineering attack a few years ago that happened on a city. And um, the way they did it was the city blocked the attack properly with all the good mail filtering. But then the person called in, hey, I'm a contractor for some thing. Uh, can you open this file attachment? Oh, I don't see it. Oh, uh, do you have a personal email address I can send it to? And the person gave yeah. them their Yahoo. They logged into their Yahoo address and the ransomware fun began. Yeah. Uh, clever social engineering. Um, and all it took was them logging in there. I mean, you can try to block mail.yahoo and those are good things to do, but not everybody does that. Not everyone has always the sophistication. Um, and also the, it's harder to block Gmail if you're a G suite company or some of the Microsoft sites, because you can log in with a personal one on some of those sites. Yeah. So that comes back to you flagging anytime someone logs in with a non business email address. That's one of the things you can completely trigger on, right? Yeah, absolutely. And this is actually one of our components in the shadow IT is how much of this is work login versus not. And you can see the breakdown here, you know, going through the filter, a lot of work usage is good, but then we start to see the break off. And this is where we get into personal. And in this case, we may not see uh, an incident where there's share, uh, a blend, but in a lot of real world examples, we'll see a breakdown where there's, you know, 50% of the apps are all work sanctioned, maybe 20% of the app are personal. And then we get this weird middle ground where some people are accessing a resource with a personal account. Some people are accessing a resource with a work account. Uh, and those are areas that will highlight every one of our apps. Actually, we have a uh, in the background, a shadow IT score, and it's impacted based off um, are people using work and personal being blended? Is it a high risk app? Is it uh, lots of people or is it siloed? Um, and that's when we present here in this screen, kind of those top 10 things to talk about. Yeah. In this is comes back to the onboarding offboarding. For example, someone leaves. Oh, they logged into this site. Good. We have that. Oh, what'd they use? Oh, they were using our personal email. Well, I need to do a password reset because I don't have their password. And we already, uh, that person has already left the building. They're gone. They don't work here anymore. How do we get access to that? Oh, 
yeah, now it's not registered to the company address. You know, we can't yep. just redirect that email. Boy, that's happened, uh, unfortunately, a lot. <laughs> that's <laughs> well, and, and that's actually one of the areas we get pushed into a lot. We're really innovating in our employee offboard um, area because the reason we actually rolled out single sign-on detection was to make life easier for our MSPs when it came down to um, offboarding and onboarding. And so, you know, one of our key reports here is like this employee offboard report and checklist. And this is something we've rolled out to help, um, you know, focus on what tactically needs done on pullover a version we have here of that same user. Um, but like tactically what needs done. And the reason I want to pull this here is to bring light to some of these things. Um, first off, how many apps were being used with single sign-on? So when you remove them from 365, what are you also revoking them from? Um, being able to present that right here as a frontline item. Um, what apps did you, were not part of a single sign-on? So Adobe Connect, for instance, here, you didn't take them out when you offboarded them, your line of DMARC ended here because you weren't able to get them out of Adobe Connect. Or in this case, it looks like this MSP may have flagged himself as managed by partner. Uh, so they, they know now on their checklist to go into Adobe Connect. But also, what are the desktop apps that they were using that by revoking access to the endpoint, you'll be able to revoke access? And this is kind of the screen for the partner to look at, but this is really the screen for the client to look at. Okay, here are the things that aren't managed by my partner. My partner doesn't take care of the GoDaddy account. That's managed by Ralph internally or Code Creators and Cornerstone. These things are stuff that my MSP either doesn't know about or doesn't have access to remediate out, wasn't merged in a single sign-on. And this is what's left for me. And this becomes really valuable when offering the part customer or a key employee like earlier, um, because now you know what you weren't able to clean out so that you can give them a line of things to say, hey, maybe we should take care of that moving forward for you. But right now, let's work together to get this stuff out of here. And these are before you offboard an employee, really important to run, run because yeah. this is where you get that answer. Did they log in into how many of these with their personal uh, email addresses so we can start working towards that change? And by the way, the PDF reports are pretty slick that come out of this. I was playing around with those. They easy to, easy to do, easy to uh, set up and print. Yeah. Well, and one thing also that does flag in a lot of these cases here that's not in that pre-can one I had there. Um, you know, not only just one account, but what are the other accounts they're accessing? Are they using a service account like general at, um, are they using personal accounts down to some of these resources? This key user I chose maybe doesn't have it here, but were they using personal logins? And then we'll also show a little alert icon, uh, and show you a segment. So for instance, if Dwayne managed to use QuickBooks with somebody else's account, um, we'll show you the other users that were using that account that now by rotating out that's that service password, you need to inform those other people uh, that were using QuickBooks. Hey, you were sharing with Dwayne. Dwayne's leaving. We need to rotate that password. So trying to give them a real tactical checklist of things to take care of. Um, it, because right now it's it's just guesswork and it really just doesn't get done in a lot of cases, unfortunately. Well, and this is nice. It helps build that list because I, I know plenty of people have this in a spreadsheet somewhere. It's yeah. it's usually enabled web sign-in passwords.xls. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not passwords. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, last thing I want to touch on is your ability to have visibility in a browser. Um, does that include right now or will it in the future, the ability to see whether or not they've turned on things like password saving uh, as, a, as an option? I know it's something you were looking at. Yeah. So um, one area that we're continuing to uh, add data around is the password um, area and what how they're leveraging the actual password itself. We do have a browser account security report. We'll enhance and enrich this thing as we mature. Um, you know, if you ever follow me on LinkedIn and hear about how we're doing releases, it's really partner influenced. We're directly tapped in building what their requests. So whereas we may not see password syncing or other things like that, um, we do collect a handful of uh, browser configurations um, and all of the data we collect is presented out to the customer for them to, or for you, the partner to see. Like this case here was our reaction to Cisco when they had a personal login, uh, you know, be part of a compromise. We would see, you know, were they logged in up here in the browser with their personal account or were they logged in um, down in the actual um, browser with their work account? And so we brought this to light. We found on average, by the way, this is interesting, uh, about 52 percent the average across all of our customer base. 52 percent of users are using work accounts. 30 percent are using personal accounts and the rest just don't have an account. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Which is a lot of users with, 
potential credit card data saved or a lot of users with potential password change saved or any litany of things that probably just shouldn't be in there. And, and for context, what happened with Cisco was someone was logged in with their personal Gmail, but using stuff in the browser from Cisco, and then they hit save password. So even if they were using a password manager, their personal account synchronization was synchronizing the business account passwords within there. Um, and then someone logged into that account to get the passwords they needed for things because, you know, the password syncs. So all I got to do is get that person's personal Gmail email, I synchronize a browser logged in as them. Now I have all the passwords that they had saved in that browser. So it, it really creates a scary uh, a scenario. Well, it does. And these are just one of the many things we're trying to solve. This whole, uh, the minute we pull, I, I joked earlier, we lift the hood. The minute yeah. we lifted the hood, it got wild. So one thing that we have done, and, and this can help kind of summarize here, you know, we've touched maybe five or 10% of the platform, but what we do is create something for you as the MSP called the SAS health score. And that's our guiding principle. That is all these different things. It's personal logins into a, a browser account. It's shared accounts. It's services accounts. It's shadow IT. It's, you know, all these litany of issues boiled into a score. And the beautiful thing is when you're talking with your customer uh, during your QBR lifecycle, presenting the SaaS health score, we present kind of those top 10 remediation steps per score. So how many things are shadow IT that need remediated? How many of those things are uh, core IT that need remediated? How many shared accounts have we seen since we last worked with you? Um, we didn't even talk about the QBR stack or the application stack rules that we can build, but it's all these areas um, that we give you tactical stuff to talk to your customer about versus, um, you know, personally, I would say it's a bit overwhelming for most MSPs who are going from nothing to all of this. Um, so that's where we as a uh, not only technology vendor that came from the MSP, um, but as implementation managers, as edu engineers, we're trying to focus on teaching the MSP what SaaS management means because it's really nascent in the industry. We're just excited to shepherd a tool in and, and build a practice around it. Yeah, and this is one of the cool things too. You have the talking points in your reports. So it helps guide you through what you should be talking to the customers about. So you're not just umming through a bunch of data. You're, you have talking points in there, which I think is really helpful. Yeah, and, and to that degree, the only thing I'll mention that would I'd be remiss if I didn't cover is in those talking points, my and this is what actually... This shows why I love working with the USP community uh, is we have a part of our platform called uh, VCIO community. And so across all of our partners, we've now curated about 700 tips for SaaS management. Uh, and this is something that's unique to SaaSleo. And so when you're presenting those QBRs, what we do is we look at the Delta from when you last presented it to when you're now presenting it, look at the shadow IT and we can bring in QBR rules. So not only can we predefine an app's configuration like, Box.com, you know, we're going to say is probably we need to evaluate this on each customer and, you know, it's not business owner required. But we can also say if we see Box.com for the first time with a customer environment, we can make notes that will present the QBR. We can hand type a handful of ways that we want to do it. But we can also lean into this VCIO community, save these points. And now every customer moving forward will inherit these VCIO notes. So, you don't have to be uh, the smartest person in the room or you don't have to be the CEO of the MSP. You can allow your technical account managers to inherit these talk tracks that you've maybe defined. So, you know, every time you talk to an app, it's not tribal knowledge. It's an actual functional way you talk to your customer about this. Yes. And I wanted to point this out as well. Uh, publish uh, comment to all clients. I noticed there's ways to uh, make this information available that I can type up in here and then add it to the collective information. So I think that's kind of a, uh, it's a nice feature. And I see how you're building that kind of like you have community within your tool. Yeah. And these are all community driven comments. When we actually released this feature, we released it maybe four or five months ago. We had 300 notes, we're up to 700, but those original 300 came from our partners. We just emailed our partners and said, Hey, would you like to be part of this community? And, you know, I would have never thought is, is, is SP, SPF, DKM, and DMARC set up for email and configured and include MailChimp. It makes sense. But as an MSP, I would have maybe just thought, oh, MailChimp, not a worry. But now moving forward, every customer I talk to, if I see MailChimp in their environment, whether it's a assessment of an existing customer or onboarding a new one, I know that that's going to be part of my talk track with the customer when I present the assessment findings report. Yeah, I, I like that community driven aspect. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I didn't know about it when I first started demoing it. And me and you've known each other for a minute. So yeah. I was like, oh, this is a neat feature he's got in here. <laughs> we, 
Well, we build lots of things. Uh, we love when people use them. And so one day we'll have to get like a three hour long session and we can jump into everything. But, um, <laughs> you know, I'll put it this way. If you try to get your toes wet and what SaaS manager SaaS discovery means, um, you know, we've figured it out for lots of partners. It's still a new, new challenge to be solved. And so yes. I'm curious, uh, curious to see people's response or feedback or thoughts from today's pres you know, presentation and talk and well, see what they think it should mean. Absolutely. Leave comments below for all of that. Um, but in terms of people who want to get started with this and start messing around with it, uh, you uh, will have a link down there to get you start, signed up with SAS. So you have how long of a trial does it start right now? 250 endpoints for 30 days. Um, so you can take that, you can deploy it, you get to walk away with any of the data you collect. We don't stop it. It's not blurred out lines. It's not on and off features. It's, it's the full. It's features. the full thing. You get a trial on there. Uh, your onboarding is is relatively simple. The deployment. If you and if you're not using an RMM tool, uh, you have options to deploy this. As we said, like through Active Directory pushes. Um, you got PowerShell scripts that you can just paste in to a admin level PowerShell and just go and it'll just install it. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Well, that's what our claim to fame. You, you meet with an implementation manager, 15 minutes, any RMM will get you deployed. Yeah. So go ahead, click those links, get started if you're interested in this product. Uh, maybe if you're lucky enough, depending on how busy John is when you're watching this video, he'll he'll help onboard you personally. <laughs> I won't guarantee that though. <laughs> we'll see. I don't know. Reference Tom in the link. We'll get Tom a special slug on our website. And if you go to sasley.com slash Tom, then maybe there we we'll do a special calendar where we can sit down and chat about it. Yeah. So thanks for uh, sponsoring this episode, John. This has been great. Um, I actually really like the product as well. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm smiling because we've been playing with it and using it. I, I really see the blind spots um, that were that are coming to light. Even my own company of just making sure we understand everything uh, that all of my staff is using as we've grown. So uh, thanks again for doing this. And uh, links are down below to what we talked about. Sign up for a demo if you're interested. This is pretty awesome. Uh, thanks. Thanks for having me here, Tom. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thanks.